Good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. So tonight we are going to be studying the book of Amos and just chapters one through two. It's not a huge book. I think it's only about 30 some odd verses total, but it is action packed worth of in, full of information. So before we do anything, though, what's a, who's the most important person to have here when we study? The Holy Spirit. So let's bow our heads and pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you. We come to the throne of grace. Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to dwell in this place, to descend here, Lord, to fill everyone here, and especially myself. Lord, that your words may be spoken, that your thoughts may be expressed, and Lord, out of all this, that your love may be seen. As you try and help people come to you, Lord, to come back from the ways that they've strayed. Lord, we pray that each one of us might glean something from the lesson tonight, that we might draw us closer to you, Lord, that might reveal your character and your love, the depth of it, even more so to us. And Lord, that we might not only come to know you better, but Lord, that we might truly be transformed by, by beholding Guide us in your truth, not only us that are here, but those that are online as well, Lord, watching. And help us to truly not only know you better, but to be more like Christ Jesus himself. We thank you and pray this to your Father in heaven, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, so, so far the Minor Prophet series we've studied so far, there's really three. We had an introduction. But we're looking at Obadiah, was the first one, who prophesies about the judgment of Edom. Then there's Joel, who talked a lot about the locust plague and the day of the Lord. And finally, we have Jonah, God's messenger to the Assyrian city of Nineveh. I'm not sure who fared better out of that one, Nineveh or Jonah, because it kind of leaves you hanging, right? But, and we don't know the outcome. But now we come to Amos. What do we know about Amos? Well, we know he's a shepherd and a gatherer of sycamore fruit in the town of Toka, or Teka, T-E-K-O-A. Um, and actually in Amos 7, 14 and 15, then Amos replied to Amaziah, I am not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet, for I am a herdsman and a grower of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock and the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. Amos is there to proclaim the sin and judgment of eight nations in these first two chapters. And he has an awful lot to say about Israel. He says the best for last. The book of Amos is divided into three sections. There's chapters one and two, which is the oracle about sin and judgment for those eight nations. There's chapters 3 through 6, which are the prophetic message for Israel, God seeking for Israel to repent and come back to him. And then there's chapters 7 through 9, are the execution of that judgment if Israel doesn't change their ways. By the way, the definition of oracle that we mentioned for the first two chapters is, um, is the divine utterance delivered to man, usually in an answer to a request for guidance. An actual example of that would be in 2 Samuel 16, 23. In case you want to look it up, we don't actually have it on the screen. So what do we know about Amos? He has stated previously he was a sheep breeder and a tender of the sycamore fruit. Even though they were eaten, they weren't considered the best kind of food, those sycamore figs. He hails from Toko, or, yeah, Teko? It's a, yeah, Teko. A small town 12 miles south of Jerusalem and 18 miles west of the Dead Sea. He is not educated, as the world calls education, but I love the quote from the SDA Bible commentary. It is what a man is and not alone what he has that fits him for the service of God. They say it very well. Amos definitely had the right stuff for God to use him. He was poor but independent, 
because when he actually leaves this time to go basically preach to Israel, if he wasn't independent, he couldn't leave his flocks and things for that long. Um, his name in Hebrew is derived from the verb amas, to load or to carry a load. Hence, his name means a burden bearer, appropriate for the messages God has asked him to speak. So God calls Amos to preach his message. What is the condition of Judah and Israel at this time? Are they going through hard times? Is it prosperous? Maybe somewhere in between? Right now, the king in Judah is Uzziah. And how was his reign? I know, I'm asking. So Uzziah, actually, he is the one that followed God. He's the one who fortified Judah. The Lord had given him many victories. And you'll probably remember him because we always remember the negative stuff. He's the one who got so prideful that he decided to burn incense in the temple. And God made him a leper because of it. So his reign did not end so well, but it started great. And for many years, it was good. In 2 Chronicles 26, 4 through 9, it says, He did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He continued to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding through the vision of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God prospered him. Now he went out and warred against the Philistines and broke down the wall of Gath and the wall of Jabna and the wall of Ashdod. He, and he built cities in the area of Ashdod and among the Philistines. God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabians who lived in Gerbaal and the Menites, or Menites. The Amorites also gave tribute to Uzziah and his fame extended to the border of Egypt for he became very strong. I know I can't put the proper words to this. Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate and at the valley gate and at the corner buttress and fortified them. And it talks about a lot of other things. He was big into agriculture. He actually was an inventor, apparently, and invented war machines for his use. So he was at the top of his game. Not only was Judah prosperous, they were actually following God. Although we're going to find out later, maybe not quite as well as we thought. So now let's look at the king of Israel, King Jeroboam II. Not to be confused with the first one that broke away from Solomon's son. Um, in 2 Kings 14, 25 and 28, he restored the border of Israel from the entrance of Hamath and as far as the Sea of Ar Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was of gath Hefer. Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam and all that he did and his might, how he fought and how he recovered for Israel, Damascus and Hamath, which had belonged to Judah, are they not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So he actually gained land back for Israel from the neighboring countries, and he fortified some borders, and, you know, Israel was doing well as well. At the time of Amos, it looks like Israel is very prosperous too. Based on the reign of both kings, Amos preached anywhere from 767 B.C. to 753 B.C., because those are the only two kings that are mentioned in Amos. So, and that's the only time that those kings, their reigns overlapped. But what was the problem in Israel? For that, we would have to go to the beginning. 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 26 through 30. Would someone like to read that? Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom will return to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will return to their Lord, even to Reboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to Reboam, king of Judah. So the king consulted and made two golden calves, and he said to them, 
It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel, that brought you from the land of Egypt. He set one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. So a little backdrop or history on this. So Solomon has passed the throne to his son Rehoboam, right? And remember, they ask him, are you going to work us as hard as you did? Solomon did. And he goes, I'm going to work you twice as hard. So they said, we had enough of this. We quit. We're, you know, we're going home. And that's when they formed the, the ten tribes or northern part of Israel. Now, when he did that, he's like, how am I going to get these people not to go to Judah and worship at the temple? I have to come up with something to keep them here. Otherwise, they're going to go and join back with Judah, and I'm going to lose my power, and they'll kill me. So he sets up two golden calves, one at Bethel, at the very south, close to the border with Judah, really Benjamin, and the other one was in the far north with Dan. So he's like, one end or the other, you have a place to go worship the golden calf that brought you out of Israel. Yeah, sounds familiar, huh? Man, Satan doesn't have to come up with new stuff, does he? So... We see, though, the patience that God has with us, with Israel. Two golden calves brought them out of Egypt. Sure they did. And, um, so, and now you see why during this time, Israel is really the one that needs saving. Comparatively speaking, between them and Judah, they are in way worse shape. So <clears throat> it is the pagan worship he instituted to keep Israel from Jerusalem. And that, that literally... It, he tried to convince them that they're worshiping God, but they're not worshiping God. So let me ask you, when is the easiest time to reach someone with God's word? When they are down or have fallen, when they've hit rock bottom? And when is it the hardest? When they have need of nothing. That is, when, that is where Israel is right now. So we mentioned earlier, these are oracles against eight nations we're going to start off the first nation we're going to visit is damascus and that's going to be chapter one verses two through five and the rest of them are listed there interesting every city or nation has two to four verses that talk about it right and the situation they're in but when we get to the end with israel they have 11 verses so it's really all about israel we're just getting there and actually showing some of the things that are happening with the nations around them so they must be up to something really bad though to have 11 verses so we're going to see that the first six nations can actually be broken in three sets of two so you would have damascus and god one set tyre and edom or edom as being the second and amman and moab as being the third and really if we wanted to we could say there's a fourth set and that would be um judah and israel but so let's dive in and take a look at the nation of Syria. Damascus is its capital. So, and a lot of times I'll say the capital city to denote the nation. So if we read Amos 1, 1 through 5, and <clears throat> do I have any volunteers? Yeah. Brian? Oh. Okay, go ahead. The words, from <clears throat> Amos, the, the words of Amos, who was among the sheep herders from Tekoa, which he envisioned in visions concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, son of jo Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. He said, The Lord roars from Zion, and from Jerusalem he utters his voice, and the shepherds pastured around gr uh, grounds mourn, and the summit of Carmel dries up. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not revoke its punishment because they threshed Gilad with implements of sharp iron. So I will send fire upon the house of Hazael 
and it will consume the citadels of Ben Hadad. I will also break the gate bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitants from the valley of Aben. And him who holds the scepter from Beth Eden. So the people of Aram will go exile for Kir, says the Lord. Thank you, Brian. So although we have no written history specifically about an earthquake in verse 1 that they're talking about, it is mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. So Zechariah 14.5 says, Apparently the earthquake, because apparently the earthquake was so big, it, they had memories of this. So 14.5 says, You will flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel. Yes, you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the, Uzziah, the king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. So this earthquake was apparently enough to leave an impression, even though we don't have a historical record of it. We look at verse 2. The Lord roars from Zion. What do you think that means? The Lord screaming at me from Zion is God's presence, where God is. And it, actually, um, we could read Joel 3.16. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth tremble, but the Lord is a refuge for his people and a stronghold to the sons of Israel. God is reminding everyone the only true safety is with him. And in verse 2, when it says, from Jerusalem, he utters his voice. Where did God dwell on earth at that time? In the temple, right, the Shekinah glory. That was before the Babylonians destroyed the temple. The Ark of the Covenant was still there at that time, too. So, how or did he dwell in Dan or Bethel, where the golden calves are? No. From, what, um, from the vegetation are, that the sheep, you know, the pastures, to the lush growth on Mount Carmel, the whole land will experience God's vengeance. And if you've been to Mark Car Mount Carmel, it is actually pretty green up there, surprisingly, because the mountains aren't mountains like we think of. You don't think of Sierra Nevada when you go to Israel. You think like 2,500, maybe 3,000 feet, and you are really up there. So, so no place is safe except for unless the Lord is sheltering you from his, from his wrath. So we move to verse 3, and the beginning of the judgments being pronounced against the six surrounding nations first. Before Judah and Israel get their judgments. So we just want to understand the scripture. The phrase for three transgressions of and whatever city or nation it's talking about. And for four, I will not revoke its punishment is actually an idiom. So do you know what an idiom is? It's kind of a phrase. And um, let, I'll give you an example. It's raining cats and dogs, right? Are there literal cats and dogs coming down? No, but it's a phrase that's supposed to represent something else. This idiom of basically for three transgressions of in the city and for four, I will not revoke its punishment is actually referring to repeated violations. So even though scripture just brings in one thing that they've done like the worst, there is a lot more stuff that they're doing that they're not supposed to be doing. So God is literally trying to bring these nations and, and let alone Israel back to him or to him for the first time. So let's keep that in mind. It's not just the one thing scripture says. There's a whole bunch of stuff that we don't know about that goes along with it. So we see that. Um, so let's actually continue with verse 3. Um, actually, the idiom implies that it has been the ongoing horrible problem and that showed no signs of letting up. And verse 3 talks about Damascus, where the capital is. But that capital is really um, in Syria, or another name for it is Aram, or Aram. And so if you look at this map, you will see, and if you do it on the computer, the maps are at the very end, but the very last page. So... It's actually right up here. And you can see that. 
And we're actually going to note the position of these in a little bit later. So, and don't confuse it with the Assyrians. They're a little farther north. They're Assyrians and Assyrians. So, um, because they have threshed Gilead with implements of sharp iron. So what do you think that means? What have they done to Gilead that's so bad? Okay, do you know that you, the, you're familiar with the threshing floor, at least, or the concept of it, right? So what you do, you have a hard floor, and you put the grain down on it, and then you use like a sled. Oh, no, the, for this, they use a sled, and it has iron bands around it. And then they have like an ox or something drag it across so it pummels the wheat to separate the wheat from the chaff. Okay, and it has little bumps on it to help break it up. So imagine somebody lying down and a heavy wood sled with iron bands with little bumps or little almost spikes on it coming over them. That's the picture that the scripture is trying to convey. And actually, 2 Kings 10, 32 and 33. And those days, the Lord began to cut off portions of Israel and Haziel defeated them throughout the territory of Israel. Now, this guy, Haziel, he's actually Syrian. Um, from the Jordan eastward, all the land of Gilead, the Gadites, and the Reubenites, and the Manassehites, from Arir, which is by the valley of Arnon, even Gilead and Bashan. Apparently, the Syrian Haziel invaded Israel. But it is what he did that caused the trouble. The SDA Bible commentary says this about the threshing instruments. Sleds or carts made of heavy planks fastened together, underneath which sharp stones or iron points were inserted, weighted down with the heavy stone and with the driver. These instruments were drawn by oxen over grain. And it gives uh, scripture examples. Um... And in the last clause of Amos 1.3 reads, because they sawed with iron saws the women with child of the Gada, Gadalites. So in other words, he's a pretty vicious guy. When you're going after women and children and things like that in war, are there rules to war? Today we have something called the Geneva Convention, right? A certain etiquette you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to target civilians or things like that. But back then, they still had these rules, but they didn't always adhere to them. So we look at 2 Kings um, 8, 12. Haziel said, why does my Lord weep? Then he answered, because I know the evil that you will do to the sons of Israel. Their strongholds you will set on fire. And their young men you will kill with the sword. And their little ones you will dash in pieces. And their women with child you will rip up. Sounds like a real peach, huh? So how do you think this settles with God? Yeah. God is saying to Syria, this is what you're doing to my people, to Gilead. Talk about the analogy between the threshing floor and the people of Gilead. They, um... They are, yeah, the Syrians did something like that to the conquered people of Gilead. So once you conquer a people and they have no power, right, you can do some pretty awful things to them. We're going to see it actually gets worse through the lesson. Whether they were destroyed entire villages or massacred the people, we don't know, but one may say, it's war. You know, you can do whatever it takes to win, right? <clears throat> that's a mentality that's pretty popular. Even if people fight, they're like, you know, if they fight dirty, I do whatever it takes to win, right? Well, it's me or them, and I want to make sure I come out on top. But it is the ruthless behavior that comes after the victory that God is condemning. Now one could say they're pagans. They don't know any better. They don't know God's law. And I would reply, yes and no. Are the pagans keepers of the oracles of God, his truth and his law? No, they're not. But we read Jeremiah 31, 33. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them 
and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they will, shall be my people. Does God write his law on everyone's heart? Yes. And we know this because, and I've used this before, but even the tribes where people have encountered were the outside world, say in the Amazon, right? They have words for good and bad. They have words for um, evil even. They have words for murder. How do they have that? If they've known nothing but the jungle their whole lives, because God writes his law on their hearts. They still have a basic knowledge. And whether you want to call it your conscience or whatever it may be, God still puts that knowledge in each and every person, even the pagans. So they have some knowledge. And we know that God judges you on the light that you've been given. So the Syrians did what they knew was wrong. Their conscience would tell them, of course it would. In verse 4, fire is often used in war. God has a bone to pick with Haziel to consume the citadel of Ben-Hadad. Literally means, and Ben-Hadad, Ben means son, right? Hadad is their God. So son of, or the son of Hadad. In 1 Kings 21, it says, Now Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, gathered his army, and there were 32 kings with him, and horses and chariots, and he went up and besieged Samaria and fought against it. So he literally, one of the kings, they had a panache for fighting with Israel, apparently. They had a special joy or something like that, but they were, Israel was not out of their escape. So we see that, um, that in verse 5, I will also break the gate, gate bar of Damascus, and for the four, I will not revoke its punishment. So what do gates symbolize in like a fortified city? The it's the entrance. It is also, what's the weakest part of the defenses of the city? The gate. The gate. So if you open the gate, you have access to everything. Remember what's on Babylon, when they opened the gate where the river was flowing through it, Right? They open the gate. All you have to do, they got through that one. They go in and open one of the big gates. Babylon's done. It was conquered that night. So once you get the gate open, if God opens the door for that gate, the um, Syrians are done. So we look at Beth Eden as it continues in verse 5. And the house of delight is what that actually means. Because like Bethlehem is a house of bread, right? Beth Eden is the house of delight. Those in the house of delight will go into exile. So decreed God. So how do the Syrians end? Mm -hmm. By who? Assyria. The Assyrians. The Assyrians did a lot of God's work cleaning up business. But same Assyrians that conquered Israel and that almost conquered Judah. Because they actually conquered Lachish. Um, but when it came to Jerusalem... They implored God, and God wiped out, what was 185,000 of them? One angel. Took out 185,000 guys in, in one night. So the Syrians no longer exist as a people. So next we're going to move to Gaza. That's number two on our list. And I'm going to show you where Gaza is on the map. You might recognize them more as the, um, the Philistines. So here is the Syrians, or Aram. Gaza is right down here. So we're going to go over the, a few more, we're going to go over the significance, oh, got him, that, um, the pattern of that. But So Gaza, or the Philistines, basically. Let's read Amos chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. Would someone like to read? Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not revoke its punishment, because they deported an entire population to deliver it up to Eden. So I will send, the, send fire upon the wall of Gaza, and it will consume her citadels. I will also cut off the inhabitants from Ashdod, and him who holds the scepter from Ash Ashkelon, I will even unleash my power upon Ekron. 
and the remnant of the Philistines will perish, says the Lord God. Thank you, Brian. So first of all, how do the Philistines feel about the Jews? Think of David and Goliath. Do they like each other? Do they get along sometime? They pretty much don't like each other at all. <laughs> and so uh, we look at that after many wars and skirmishes that had been. Um, it just says a lot about their constant ongoing struggle. So in verse 6 lies the sin which God holds against the Philistines. Remember, the idiom is actually in verse 6 about the, for the three transgressions of Gaza and for the four I will not revoke its punishment. That's the same thing basically saying you've done a lot of bad things, but I'm going to point out the worst thing. It's and, amazing, isn't it? Like, like, who is it? Abraham said it to God, like bargaining about the, uh, what is it? Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah? Yeah. If I have, if I see 10 up to 5, is it down up to 5? I think he, it was either, I think it was 10. I don't think he yeah, got down so to 5. It's, it's yeah, nice. but it's kind of like bargaining. But like 40 or 50 down to 10. But even that, for this one, it's like 4 people will be righteous there. I will not punish them. Right. That's amazing. So, but what they did, and what the Philistines did, um, is the worst. So, uh, and we're going to actually look at that. Um, God is highlighting the worst one. And that worst one is that they deported an entire population to deliver up to Edom. So why is that bad? Once again, it's war, right? You're allowed to do these things in war, one would think. They're at your mercy. But back then in war, it was not uncommon for captured soldiers to be sold as slaves. You're trying to kill me and I capture you. Why wouldn't I make some money off of you, right? If I could. But what the Philistines did, while they had that advantage, while they had everyone at their mercy, in other words, um, it was, there was nobody left to stop them, they would enslave the entire population. So everyone, men, women, children, young and old alike, soldier or civilian, it doesn't matter. They herded up everyone. Even if you're like old, you're 90, like, I bet I can get about a dollar for them. Somebody will pay a dollar. That everyone had a dollar sign on their heads. So you look at that, and who did they sell them to? Edom. We talked about this, if you remember, back with um, Obadiah, right? So he talks a lot about Edom. Did Edom like Israel or Judah? Yeah. No, there was a good devil, of course. They're going to be go eternal death, Edomite. Well, yeah, but at one point in time, right, they, they might have got along a little bit. It's very scarce. But when, when Israel came out of, um, and we'll cover this in lesson, but when they came out of, um, out of Egypt, they wouldn't let them pass through the land. Most of the time, they were at odds with them. So now the Philistines capture, take whole villages of Jews and sell them to Edom, their sworn enemy. How do you think they were treated? Philistines are like, I don't care. I'm getting paid. It's all about money. Boy, has it really changed? <laughs> so, you know. Happen, so they learn a lesson out of it. Well, it's it's. You know what? I'll say something. Even when Joseph was down there, he killed him with kindness, right? And God blessed him. Even with the slave girl with Naaman. Remember when he had leprosy? She goes, there's a prophet in Israel. It was Elisha, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a possibility, and no matter what life throws at you, if you stick with God, he will pull you through. Yeah. So, um, so let me ask you. How do you think God feels about slavery? In the law of Moses, could someone sell themselves into slavery? No. no. You could. You could sell yourself into slavery to another Jew. But how long would it... No one was ever forced into it. So how long would it last? Your slavery. Seven years. Seven years. So every seven years, so if you were sold into slavery, the price you sold yourself depended on how soon you would be free. 
if it's a full seven years, then you're getting top-notch dollar. If there's only two years left before you're going to be free, your rate's much lower, right? But that was in Israel because God never intended for anyone to be a slave for life. And even like if you were super poor and had to sell yourself, you would be free again. So God frowns on permanent bondage. And then um, to top it off, they are enslaved for profit, for money. And any thoughts on how this related to Obadiah? We talked about it a little bit, right? With Obadiah, because Edom, Esau set up camp in Edom. And this was during the time when he met um, Jacob coming back after he left Laban, right? And during that time, he, he'd already set up shop there. Now, if you remember a quick review on that, what highway went through Edom? And actually went through Petra and all that. Does anyone remember? Yeah, what highway? It was a king's highway. So it was a huge commerce trade, and they actually had a toll or a tax for coming through there. So Edom got rich. So Edom is doing so well, and <clears throat> their pride is swelling and all these things. So man, just to buy some Hebrew slaves... Oh, I've got it made. I can do whatever I want to them. Isn't it like we started this in the first lesson that Baba taught? What was the first book? Is, uh, it was Obadiah. I actually taught that one. Obadiah? Yes. Edom is going to be cursed eternally? Well, yes. yes. Well, actually, they have something coming up with this too. But so. so, and slavery is so bad, quite honestly, is it legal anywhere in the world right now? Keyword is legal. I don't think it is. Now, illegal? Yes, we know there's a whole, there's millions of people that are enslaved illegally in this world right now. That's a whole different subject for now. But So later, Gaza was conquered by Egypt and then by Alexander the Great and other invaders. So let me ask you, are there any Philistines today? Not Palestinians, Philistines. No. Wiped out. They do not exist. They cease to exist as an ethnicity. And the, the answer to that one is do not mess with God. <laughs> so Zechariah 9, 6, it says, And a mongrel race will dwell in Ashdod. That was one of the cities in the Philistines, right? And I will cut off the pride of the Philistines. So the Philistines had their stronghold cities, and each city actually had its own king. So they didn't have one king over the whole region, but they often came together to actually fight against someone. And you think of like, um, you know, Goliath, for instance, when they were in the Valley of Elah and with Saul and everything. And David slays Goliath, and they all run to their cities where they're from, but they don't run to one place. So Damascus and Gaza, we looked at that. Their sins are against basic human rights, things that God says is wrong to do to people, period. And as we'll see in the next four nations too, wrong is just wrong. So the third nation is Tyre. Notice the pattern on the top of the previous two maps. So we're gonna show you this. So if we do this, and Tyre is up here, right? So if we draw a line from Damascus to Judah, and then we're gonna draw a line eventually from Tyre to um, to Edom, actually, no. So, but if you're going to see, it makes an X. And in that X, if you draw it, what's smack dab in the middle? Israel. Israel. Who this is all about. So, I know when I was reading that in the study guide, I'm like, so even God plans the order, and if you do the thing, it's like it still focuses on Israel. So, so we're going to read Amos um chapter 1 verses 9 through 10 would someone like to read that thus says the lord for three transgressions of tyre and for four i will not revoke its punishment because they delivered up an entire population to eden and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood so i will send fire upon the wall of tyre and i will consume her citadels Thank you. So wait a minute. 
Tyre and Edom are worse than the Philistines because it progressively gets worse, right? It's the next two and it's the next in the set of two, right? But they did the same thing as the Philistines. So why would it be worse when you look at that scripture? What makes them worse? Their sin more heinous. Because they should not that law. Look at the line, the last line in verse 9. I will not revoke its punishment because they delivered up an entire population to Edom and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. They had a brotherhood? <laughs> Or I read 1 Kings 5, 1. Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon when he heard that they had anointed him king in place of his father. For Hiram had always been a friend of David. And 1 Kings 9, 11 through 14. Hiram, the king of Tyre, had supplied Solomon with cedar and cypress timber and gold according to all his desire. Then King Solomon gave Hiram 20 cities in the land of Galilee. So what is Hiram given all this stuff for? The timber and the gold and all that. What's it for? Isn't it God made people being generous to Solomon for the temple? Well, what was it? Okay, yeah, let me rephrase that. What was it to build? Is the temple. The temple. David couldn't build it because he had too much blood on his hands, right? So Solomon was charged to build it. And Hiram, the king of Tyre, is giving them a whole bunch of stuff. Now Solomon gave him the cities, right? So Hiram came out to, um, from Tyre to see the cities which Solomon had given him, and they did not please him. And he said, so we'll skip that part, but what are these cities which you have given me, my brother? So he's calling Solomon what? Brother. So they were called to the land of Kabul, uh, Kabul to this day. And Hiram sent to the king 120 talents of gold. How much is a talent? How heavy? It's been a while. I might have to Google it. How much does a biblical talent weigh? 75 pounds. 75 times 120. So he gave him 9,000 pounds of gold. Man, they better be on good terms. So Tyre was a friend and an ally of both King David and King Solomon. The violation of the trust is what makes it worse than the Philistines. So it's like your buddy stabbing you in the back. The Philistines were always enemies, but Tyre and Israel were brothers by a covenant in a manner of speaking. Remember King Ahab? What was his lovely wife's name? Jezebel. Jezebel. Where was she from? Tyre and Tyre and Sidon, or however Sidon, however you pronounce it. She was actually the daughter of the king. Why do kings marry daughters of kings? To keep the well, that and also a lot of times it's political alliances as well, mm -hmm. right? You're not going to attack me if your daughter's here. Mm -hmm. And so they even had a political like agreement, you know, almost like a treaty or a truce. Yet what does Tyre do in the end? Stabs him in the back. So we see that, and even though she died not in the best way, but you know. Kind of did some bad things. So what, you know, that political alliance that Ahab had, that now that treacherous Tyre. So what happened to Tyre and Sidon for, for that matter? So in other words, what happened to Tyre and Sidon after all this? So they took an entire population, right? And we, we see here, if we go back to verses 9 and 10, and they sold them to Edom once again. So it's now the southern Jews weren't to your liking in Edom. You could get northern Jews. 
So, but one way or another, they took, once again, whole communities. They just cleaned everybody out, and there was no one left. So, that, the, the, the treacherous, though, part of it is that they stabbed him in the back to do it. They had a covenant. Do you, if you think you make a treaty or an agreement with someone, does God hold you to it? Do you think, oh, but, but today is not good for me. Maybe I can just get rid of them. Or my favorite one is the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Well, until they betray you. Well, there's so. a Bible verse. Let be your, your yes, yes, and no to him. Right. And actually, um, even and they, when they talked about vows, they're like, just let your yes be yes and your no be your no. You don't need to take a vow. But even back in, in the Old Testament, they would take vows, but if you... Basically, we're trying to deceive somebody. You're breaking the commandments. So it's pretty cut and dry. So we see, though, that God used the Assyrians to take care of a lot of business when it came to payback. And the Assyrians took care of business. What was left of them, so like the ten tribes in Israel, there was nothing left. They took them all and then they deported them into exile and they mingled into the population. And even those cities were destroyed by Alexander the Great later. So it really came to nothing. Our next nation is number four, is Edom. And this brings brotherly love relationships to a new level. So Amos 1, <clears throat> verses 11 through 12. Would someone like to read? Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not revoke its punishment, because he pursued his brother with the sword while he stifled his compassion. His anger also tore continually, and he maintained his fury forever. So I will send fire upon Teman, and it will consume the citadels of Bozra. Thank you. So, <clears throat> who are the descendants of Esau? Edomite. Edomite, Edomite right. Edom. Who are the descendants of Jacob? Israel. 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 Yes. And what were Esau and Jacob to each other? Oh, they're brothers. Brothers, yep. Fighting in the womb, brothers, but still brothers, <laughs> right? And we cover this extensively in Obadiah, but we'll do a quick summary here. So when Jacob comes back from living with Laban, right, he meets Esau and his, what, 400 men, I believe. And he's worried he's going to kill him, right? But what happens? He didn't. They're friends, right? He even tries to give them livestock and everything. Esau's like, I've got more than enough. Don't worry about it, right? So, and... But when Egypt leaves, or when Israel leaves Egypt, and they ask him to pass through Edom on the king's highway, and they say, we'll pay for everything, we won't stray to the right or the left, just let us pass through, right? The answer is no. The answer is such a no that we will come out, I think the phrase was hard against you or something. In other words, we're coming out in full battle armor, ready to, to go tooth and nail on this one. You're not coming through. So... We see whatever love was there, oh, it's long gone. Is that uh, is, uh, the, the time period from Jacob and Esau to this, when they want to cross that Edomite, is what, 400 years? 400 about, four, years? about probably 400, maybe a little over. Yeah. Plus, they probably don't know anymore. Yeah, it's but you know what? Let me ask you this. When it came to Israel, now, were the Edomites under them? Yes, but they, were they as cruel to them as they could have been? No. So uh, the Edomites were a lot of times in rebellion. A lot of times they were willing to fight with, um, with Israel or Judah. And a lot of times they paid the price for it. But the whole thing was they didn't do anything nearly as bad. When they came out of Egypt, could they have fought the Edomites and won? God was giving them every victory, right? So long as they were walking with God, they could have. They could have said, God, let us pass through. Can you do something about this, right? Or petition the Lord or something. Did they do any of that? No, they went around the border. They took the long, really hard way through the desert 
to avoid a conflict. So when you look at it, Edom's kind of the instigator. In a not so good way. But remember, here is the thing, you know, God wants Israel to come to him, to ask him, to communicate with him, to, to ask him what you want us to do, Lord, we're going to pass either life. I mean, this lesson is coming up to us too every day, I mean, like, in our life, do we ask God, what do you want me to do, to Lord, today? You know, with our, with my anxious, you know, instead of me thinking it on myself, trying right. to solve the solutions, you know, I could have come to God, pray to God, and help me, Lord, and guide me. Wait, you mean we're supposed to go to God with everything? Yeah. Yes, we are. Jesus did that. But do we? Or do I wait and I take care of the little stuff, and when it gets harder, I can't do it? Then I ask God for help. And whether you realize it or not, it's pride. Man, it can take down a covering cherub angel. It can definitely take down us. The filthy so, rags all the time. Yeah, I mean, our best efforts are filthy rags because we always have some motivation, some right. selfish motivation. So, but you look at that, God's motivation is pure because it's trying to save people where his mind is still, has at least some aspect of me. So we, we actually talked about the part where they want to pasture the land. Um, so although they are under the control of Israel, and that's the 12 tribes with David and things like that, and even um, Saul, and later um, even uh, some of the other kings of Judah, you know, they continued to rebel and they hated their brother Jacob. But ultimately it was the pride, and we established that before, of Edom, the self-sufficiency, the I don't need anyone that was their undoing that led to the final judgment that God levied against them. When Jerusalem and Judah were under siege by Babylon, right? <clears throat> Who helped the Babylonians? Yeah. Edom. Catching the stragglers and turning them over to be slaves. Killing Jews caught out, of their own, out on their own trying to escape. This was the final straw with God. Edom took land in Judah and they were carried off after they were carried off to Babylon. So they actually even moved in and took some of the territory. So here is what God said through Obadiah. And we're just going to read the three verses. Would someone like to read them? Because of violence to your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame. And you will be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth, and foreigners entered his gate and cast lots up lots for Jerusalem, you too were as one of them. Do not gloat over your brother's day, the day of his misfortune. And do not rejoice over the sons of Judah in the day of their destruction. Yes, do not boast in the day of their distress. Thank you. And I actually wanted the definition for gloat, right? Mm -hmm. To contemplate or dwell on one's own success or another's misfortune with smugness or malignant pleasure. Oh, it brings a whole new feeling to that. They were so glad to be done with them. They had the upper hand. They had Babylon beating them down. God had given them into Babylon's hand. And so, um, and they tried to destroy them completely. So the Edomites see their chance. Oh, there's going to be stragglers. There's going to be some that escape. Let's wipe them out completely. So that was their desire is to truly kill their brother permanently. Too bad they didn't actually believe the prophets that said they'd come back in 70 years. That was Jeremiah, right? That pride is something, though. So it talks about the cities. Taman, right? T-E-M-A-N. It was known for its great wisdom and learning. And Bozrah was an important city. Some sources even call it the capital at certain points in time. 
But apparently that great learning and wisdom that they had, because that was one of the prideful things that Edom had actually, couldn't save them from God's judgment. So what happened to the Edomites? Does anyone remember? Or read ahead? Um, their trusted ally, the Nabataeans, to the east, took it. Now, whether it was by force or they just moved in and never left, we're not sure, but they lost their territory to the Nabataeans. And the Edomites were displaced. And once displaced, they eventually ceased to exist. So we're up to the, the fourth tribe, or fourth nation, right? You notice a pattern here in the judgment? None of them exist anymore. They're all gone. God isn't messing around. I wonder so, if they don't know, if they know their yeah. brothers. They do. Even Moses says that to them. We're brothers. And they're like, well, let's just put it this way. They might have used an unpleasant gesture. So, yeah. But, and so you look at this, if you draw the line, we've covered the first four. There and there. And if you draw the line, you get right in the middle of the X, Israel. Now, God's going to finish with the last two here. So all the nations that are surrounding Israel will be done, except for Judah, who saved them for last. Wow. So here, here it says, when Edom finally had the upper hand against Judah and ten tribes of Israel, has already been carried away by right. the Assyrians. And that's true. To because remember, but that was in the 500 um, BC, right? Um, Ju uh, the 10 tribes, I think it was Samaria fell and everyone was carted off in like 724 BC. So like almost 200 years beforehand. Before yeah, oh, 200 years before Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians. So... And when we look at this, at the very end, we're going to look at it. When they get this message, and I'll repeat this, but um, it's only like maybe 35 years tops before the Assyrians start invading Israel. Because they don't change. And God was not playing around. So, but uh, death is temporary, temporary with the Lord, right? They, they'll come back for the judgment. Well, yeah, I mean, whether it's to the resurrection or life or the resurrection of death, everyone will come back to one another. Just one lasts a lot longer than the other. Yeah. So we see that, though, that um, those four nations and how they're judged. So we're going to move to nation number five. Well, and actually, what talks about the order in which God is judging the nations and it still points to Israel. That's the focus, right? And we talked about the X already. So next is the sons of Ammon. Let's see what their primary sin is. So we've gone through our first set of two, right? Which was basically um, with the Syrians and the threshing floor example, right? And then the... Wait, let me grab it here. And then the... Um, the Gaza, the Philistines, grabbing entire populations as well. So the Syrians, it's what they did afterwards that they shouldn't have done once they'd won. And for Gaza, it was all, for the Philistines, it was all about money and just dispossessing entire groups of people, right? Then we go to Tyre and Edom, and their sin was the same. And well, actually, Tyre was the same as the Philistines, but they broke the brotherly bond. So they stabbed him in the back. And Edom just had that brotherly relationship, but it turned into brotherly hate. And so you see it keeps escalating here. So now we're going to go to Amman, and we're going to see what happened with all of this. So would someone like to read Amos 1, verses 13 through 15? Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the sons of Ammon, and for four, I will not revoke its punishment, because they ripped open the pregnant woman, women of Gilead in order to enlarge their borders. 
So I will kindle a fire on the wall of Rabbah, and it will consume her citadels. Amid war cries on the day of battle, and a storm on the day of tempest, their king will go into exile. And he and his princes together, says the Lord. Thank you. So let me ask you, first of all, who did the Ammonites come from? Ammon. Uh, you? The descendants of uh, Lot. Lot too. Ham. Oh, if you want to read the next one, um, Genesis 19, 36 through 38. Thus both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. So, and pause for a second. Remember, they got him drunk with wine. Mm -hmm. The oldest one lays with him. He doesn't even know what's happened. He's passed out. But the next night, they get him drunk again. He's passed out, and the younger one lays with them, and they both get pregnant. Wow. I'm not even going to go into the dysfunction with all this. <laughs> Okay. That's why you should not drink. Well, that's, that's true. Well, I don't think he intended to, but they, they maybe he's like, oh, what am I gonna do? The whole valley scorched now. It smells like sulfur. It's amazing. The sin just carries after the flood. That's after the flood. Yeah. You know, sin needs a friend. The sin go through her, his daughter, Lot's mm -hmm. daughter, right? Passes. Sin go through his. What? Well, who are we gonna? We're not gonna have anybody to have kids with. Let's have our fathers drunk, and you know we certainly. I, I wonder why they got the wine, even. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> so, but so bottom line, okay. Keep reading, please. The firstborn, the firstborn bore a son, and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. As for the younger, she also bore a son, and called his name Ben Ami. He is the father of the sons of Ammon to this day. Thank you. <coughs> so the Ammonites are actually related to Israel, even though they're distant relatives, right? They are still relatives. Because Lot was related to Abraham, right? His nephew. So, <coughs> so we look at this. And I have to ask, did the Ammonites, are they actually, they are related to Israel, but distantly, and did they really rip open pregnant women to enlarge their borders? That's a pretty yeah. stiff claim there, right? How cruel were they? I want to read um, Samuel, 1 Samuel 11, 1, uh, 1 through 2. Now, Nahash, the Amorite, came up and besieged Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, make a covenant with us and we will serve you. So he's actually offering to be a slave, right? Or slaves, the whole town. But Nahash, the Amorite, said to them, <clears throat> I will make it with you on this condition, that I will gouge out the right eye of every one of you. Thus I will make it a reproach on all Israel. So I'll make a peace treaty with you if I can gouge out everyone's right eye. Man. Now, now the pregnant woman thing is starting to seem a little more feasible, huh? In Judges 11 and in Jeremiah 49, 1 through 6, talks about how the sons of Ammon tried to take the land to enlarge their borders. But the icing on the cake is from the minor prophets by boys, <clears throat> a reference to the pregnant women. The first offense is against the future. Ammon particularly sought out the pregnant women and killed them so that the rising generation of the inhabitants of Gilead might be destroyed and the future task of assimilation of Gilead by Ammon might be made easier. So let me kill the generation that's to come so we can fill it in with our own people. That's, that's hardcore. Yeah. So let me, get the, let me get the helpless of the helpless and victimize them. <clears throat> they literally attack the life in the womb to assist them in their goal to assimilate the territory of Gilead. 
Now, Amon has now raised the bar with an all-new low level of sin, right? There is some Satan working there, or perhaps Moloch. Let's read the SDA Bible commentary on this. <clears throat> Their king, in Hebrew it's Malcolm, which may properly either be translated as their king or taken as a proper name for Milcom. And actually, those are the verses to see. Better known as Molech. Does anyone know who Molech is? You ever heard that name? name? Yeah. You can answer. Yes. Sacrifice their babies. To right, them. so he's got the arms out. They, yeah. So he is a god that they sacrifice babies to. He was the chief deity of the Ammonites. And those are verses that you could read for that. It was quite in harmony with the spirit of the time that the local deity or deity should be counted as sharing the fortunes of war with their worshipers. It may well be, or it may well be that Amos intended that both the king and the god of the Ammonites should be taken into captivity as an evidence of the complete defeat of that nation. And I've also wondered especially for those that were closer to term, what happened to those babies? I wonder if maybe some of them might have even gone to Moloch. Well, it's how stupid people is, right? Deceived by Satan. You know, Moloch is not even real. They just call somebody, they just but call I, like... Uh, the I'm going to tell you something, them. though. Do you think anyone would worship any of these gods if nothing ever happened? Can Satan do supernatural stuff? Yeah. He doesn't have to do a lot, I don't think, to get people to believe, right? They were willing to sacrifice their children. I'm still saying it's stupid. You just bring the name of Jesus and to defeat that, it will be done. So, but, so it, it was, they had some, it, it just keeps up in the bar, right? So, you think that, that, God has a special judgment for them? I mean, seriously, near as I can find, the Ammonites ceased to be sometime about the second century during the Roman Empire. They actually lasted longer than any of the other ones. Um, <clears throat> but as the distinct people, they are gone as well. So then let's go to the sixth nation, Moab. And <clears throat> I will read this one. Um, verses 1 through 3 in chapter 2. Thus says the Lord, for three, trans for three transgressions of Moab and for four, I will not revoke its punishment because he burned the bones of the king of Edom to lime. So I will send fire upon Moab and it will consume the citadels of Kerioth and Moab will die amid torment with war cries and the sound of a trumpet. I will also cut off the judge from the, her midst and slay all her princes with him, says the Lord. So, did Moab like Israel? When they're cutting through the land, right? Who hired Balaam to try and curse Israel? Uh, Moab. Moab. Yes, they did. There's no love loss there. They were subject to Israel during King David and Solomon. And many times after that, simply put, they, they did not like each other at all. But how did they get number six? How did they get the worst slot out of those six pagan nations? Burn the bones. <clears throat> this profanation of the body of the king of Edom. And we're going to look at <clears throat> 2 Kings 23.16. Now when Josiah turned, he saw the graves that were there on the mountain, and he sent and took the bones from the graves and burned them on the altar and defiled it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these things. So apparently desecrating somebody's bones, it's not really clear with the Bible commentary <clears throat> and things like that, but it, it is something really bad in God's eyes. And we see in Jeremiah 8, verses 1 and 2, at that time, declares the Lord, they will bring out bones of the kings of Judah 
and the bones of its princes, and the bones of the priests, and the bones of the prophets, and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem from their graves. They will spread them out to the sun, to the, or the moon, and all the host of heaven which they have loved and which they have served, and which they have gone after and which they have sought, and which they have worshipped. They will not be gathered or buried. They will be as dung on the face of the ground. So there's something, <clears throat> something significant about desecrating the bones that I, I'm going to go out of the limb could even be eternal. So since all the judgments are against God's people, except this one, right? We can only, because it's against the king of Edom, right? And burning his bones. So we can only imagine that somehow it's connected with Israel. Perhaps there was a time when the Edomites were good with God's people. We don't know the specifics of it. But the desecration of the dead's bones seems to be some really heinous crime. And as I said, possibly affecting eternal life. So one thing is for sure, the hatred that the Ammonites have for the Edomites must be great. Something similar to that, that eventual hatred the Edomites had for Judah, right? But somehow worse. And doing this, the Moabites heaped insult and sacrilege on defeat by desecrating the remains of one of the national heroes of Edom. Now, let me ask you, are they still around? Nope. The Assyrians actually took care of that too. <laughs> the Assyrians took care of a lot for God. Like Israel, they are no more. So like the ten tribes of Israel, right? They are no more either. When the Assyrians moved in, if you were a problem, they killed everybody, they did horrible things, and then they deported everyone. And they moved their own people in to work the land. So they displaced everyone, literally. So um, all the things that these six nations did are things <clears throat> people know better than to do. There are lines that people are not supposed to cross, right? There is decent people with at least some moral fiber. They just don't do these things. But these six nations took that rule book and threw it out the window. And it's funny, people seem to think that they can get away with something just because they have the power to do it. But there is a judgment that awaits us all. And whose standard are we judged by? God's. That's the only standard that matters. So, we've come to our last nation on the borders of Israel, and that's Judah. And this is our, our nation number seven. Can you imagine Amos preaching this message in Bethel? Because it's believed that he probably went from his home, right, south of Jerusalem, up to Bethel, just across the border where they had the golden calf. So he's preaching for all of these nations. Oh, the Ammonites are going to get this. The Moabites are going to get this. And the Israelites are like, yeah, give it to them, God, right? They're loving everything they're here so far. Even with Judah, when we get through that, some of them might be, I don't know. Some of them might be, I never like that guy anyway. They always condemn me for something. So, but we're going to cover Judah, right? So up to this point, it's been great. The Jews are like, oh, this is great. God, go get them. So, but we can see that there's not a word of conviction for Israel yet. So let's see how it goes with their brother for the south. Can someone read Amos? Chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. <clears throat> Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not revoke its punishment, because they rejected the law of the Lord, and have not kept his statutes. Their lies also have led them astray, those after which their fathers walked. So I will send fire upon Judah, and it will consume the citadels of Jerusalem. Okay, now wait a minute. We covered this earlier, right? The king is Isaiah. He's a good king, right? God has fortified him and strengthened him. They followed the Lord. Until Pridus took his heart and he decided to burn incense in the temple. 
Then his hand became leprous, and yeah, well, that kind of stopped him in his tracks, right? But apparently Judah wasn't as good as we think they were. Because remember that we're responsible for the light that we've been given. And those six previous nations, they only had the light written on their hearts. The God gave them the con their conscience, right? Judah had the oracles of God, his commandments, his truth, his law. They had the temple. And we read in Luke 12, 48, but the one who did not know it and committed deeds unworthy of a flogging, he will receive but few. So he's only going to receive a few cracks of the whip, right? Not the whole amount. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more. So basically your responsibility is based on the light that you've been given. When Moses struck the rock, right? And said, have your water when he was angry. Moses knew more than anyone else, knew better than anyone else. It stopped him from going to the promised land. For someone who had less light, it would not have been that great of a sin. But for Moses, it was horrible because he knew better and his heart through and through. So far more is expected from those that know the truth. But we see this, and even though we can't see it, it's not obvious, right? They're not going to high places or worshiping trees or anything like that. Those, those seeds of rebellion must be germinating somewhere because anything that is against God is sin. <clears throat> and with Judah, it only takes about two to three more kings, and Judah is right back in the pagan worship. So can anyone think of the last king that was good in Judah? He got sick, and they used figs to heal him. Figs. Well, not really. God healed him, but yeah. Is it the 15, remember his name? 15 more years. Yeah, but do you remember his name? Was it, no, uh, I forgot. Hezekiah. Oh, remember? I remember Sennacherib's at the door with the 185 Assyrians, and he lays that out at God, and God sends an angel and kills them all in one night. Okay? So that Hezekiah, he walked with God. That was good. After that, Judah kind of went to a really bad place. His son Manasseh practiced witchcraft in the temple, things like that. So it wasn't well, good. Even that he didn't end up good, Hezekiah. In you the know, end, he didn't. Yeah. Is he like, get a chance to repent? We don't know. But what we do know is that he, when Babylon came because the sundial stopped, um, we know that people from Babylon came to inquire about it. And instead of telling him about the God who stopped the sundial, he showed him all of his stuff. And then God brings a prophet to him and says, all your stuff, the Babylonians are going to take away someday. And basically, your descendants are going to be taken, like Daniel, to Babylon and be like servants in the court. And what shocked me out of all of it, at least Hezekiah was happy it wasn't going to happen during his reign. We don't know his heart. Only God does at the end. But yeah, it wasn't, he didn't end on a great note. So we see though, um, when, em, or when um, Amos speaks of this, um, even as, well, and he talks about that. So in verse five, when it talks about ending in fire, when does it actually happen? And I will send fire upon Judah, and it will consume the citadels of Jerusalem. So when did Jerusalem actually burn? Nobody right. Who did? Nero. Nope, that was Rome, and he didn't start the fire. Um, Nebuchadnezzar. He destroyed the temple. He destroyed everything. And actually, that's one of the last times you'll see when Solomon dedicates the temple, fire comes down from heaven and consumes the sacrifice, and the glory of the Lord fills the temple, right? Now, it is believed that the Ark of the Covenant was taken out before Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple and all that and hid it somewhere. But from that time on, there's never anything in Scripture written about the glory of God dwelling in the most holy place again where people can see it. So, 
I'm saying, I'm not saying it didn't happen, I'm just saying in Scripture it's not recorded. So through all that, we see that Judah will actually get theirs during the time when the Babylonians destroy the city. And it's essentially a rubble heap. So, on a side note though, um, yeah, it, it, because it, even, even in Judah, they were, they were told about it. And it tells us one thing though, like the law convicting the Judeans, what is the only safety we have in this world? And how do we study God? Besides prayer, through his word. And I like this quote from a pastor. This book, he's talking about the Bible, right? Studying the Word of God. This book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. Okay? All it takes is one cherished sin, and it can keep you out of heaven, because there's part of God's Word that you will not accept because of it, if you want to hold on to that. And that's something for us, even today, to ponder on in our lives. Now, do I have some things that I have not come to deal with yet? Yes. Do I realize there's things that I still have to give up? Yes. Thank God we have a merciful God who's patient with me. So, and it brings us to the main attraction for today's lesson. The judgment of Israel. All right, we have... Oh, okay, we can do it. We have four pages and I have to go faster. So... And number eight gets 11 verses. So now's the time when it gets real. Amos is up there in Bethel. He's got the golden calf somewhere in the background, right? He's preaching to him. And all of a sudden, they've, you know, they pretty much had no problem with anything he said until now. So would someone like to read? Um, and why has God actually given them? God has really given it to Israel here. Why is he doing that? Does he just want to make them feel bad before he kills them? What is the ultimate goal that God wants for every single one of us? Bring every sheep to himself. To take them home, right? Right. So is he just rebuking them to hopefully wake them up? Hopefully. Yes. His I think desire. God, God do the judgment sometimes to stop the sin. Well, yeah. The sin is too great, and just, just God just wiped them out. Well, there's a, time, there's a time of judgment where the sentence is passed, and then there's a time of judgment where the sentence is executed. In other words, you carry out the sentence. But the, is the um, Israelites aren't there yet. So if somebody could read Amos 2, 6 through 16. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke its punishment, because they sell the righteous for money, and the needy for a pair of sandals. Mm -hmm. These who pants after the very dust of the earth on the head of the helpless also turn aside the way of the humble. And a man and his father resort to the same girl in order to profane my holy name. On garments taken as pledges, they stretch out beside every altar. And in the house of their God, they drink the wine of those who have been fined. Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorites before them. Though his height was like a height of cedars, and he was strong as the oaks, I even destroyed his fruit above his root below. It was I who brought you up from the land of Egypt, and I led you in the wilderness forty years, that you might take possession of the land of the Amorite. Then I raised up some of your sons to be prophets, and some of your young men to be Nazarites. It, is this not so, O sons of Israel, declares the, road, the Lord? But you made the Nazarites drink wine, and you commanded the prophets, saying, You shall not prophesy. Behold, I am weighted down beneath you, as a wagon is weighted down 
when filled with sheaves. Flight will perish from the swift, and the stalwart will not strengthen his power, nor the mighty man save his life. He who grasps the bow will not stand his ground, the swift of foot will not escape, nor will he who rides the horse save life. Even the bravest among the warriors will free naked in that day, declares the Lord. Amen. That's something, huh? <clears throat> That's quite a list. So let, let's start with the thus says the Lord. The prophet is now going to denounce Israel for its injustice, its cruelty, its incest, luxury, and idolatry. Now that's some list in its own right, right? But um, remember, <clears throat> they had the same light as Judah. And I admit it's diminished, right? It's been mingled and things like that, but <clears throat> they still at least have a clue with God. So God has already called out Judah, Israel has no one around them that they can point the finger at or say, oh, they influenced me or this or anything, right? God's already convicted everyone else. So they can't justify their actions. All their neighbors have been judged. Social injustice and idolatry seem to be the main topics. And these three steps are, are three steps to Israel's decline. First of all, number one, they have rejected the law of God. Rejecting the only truth there is <clears throat> opens you up for a life of trouble and suffering. There is only one standard, and that is God's. Number two, they have been led astray by the idols they worship. We are wired to worship something, right? It seems like everyone worships something. And God made us that way, I think. Um, if it is not God, then it will either be the devil or themselves. Or the devil masquerading as something, right? So, and number three is morality doesn't even exist. After they reject God's law and seeking to worship, <clears throat> the worship or the devil or themselves, what do you think happens to morality? Because you know what? I can justify just about anything with a good rationalization. You know, I mean, it's, oh, I did it because of this. And it can sound good. But, which is probably followed by a don't judge me, but still, you know, Joel 3.3 3 gives an example of how far they had fallen in Israel. And they sell the righteous or the innocent for money. They have also cast lots for my people, treated a boy for a harlot, and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. That, God's people have almost no value. I mean, in verse 6, or the needy or for a pair of sandals. How much did a pair of sandals cost back then? $3. Yeah, they weren't expensive. Yeah, probably in our rate, probably about 3 or $5. They were not expensive. And there weren't that much. But the poor couldn't even get justice over something as inexpensive as sandals. Okay, the courts were still against them. Ezekiel 13, 19 says, For handfuls of barley and fragments of bread, you have profaned me and my people to put to death some who should not die and to keep others alive who should not live by your lying to my people who listen to lies. That's the kind of environment it was in. And the SDA Bible commentary actually Spells it out for verse 7, that pant, right? And we look at verse 7, th these who pant, okay, at the very beginning. Covetousness led to the oppression of the poor. This expression seems to represent the desire of these oppressors to see the poor crushed to the earth, to have them put in such a miserable condition that the needy would scatter dust on their heads. And Joshua 7, 5 and 6 and Job 2, 12 would be examples of that in Scripture. And it is those humble who suffer. They are not coveting like the proud and the arrogant. And a man and his father go to the same girl. Yeah, that can have a couple of meanings, actually. 
Genesis 35, 22 is one example. And it came about while Israel was dwelling in the land that Reuben went and lay with Bila, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. That would be one example. Yeah, we're not really striking any proud notes here, are we? And the other one, which is more likely, would be visiting the temple prostitutes. Now, both would damage the name of God and profane his holy name. And in verse 8, taking clothes as a pledge, this would probably be the outer garment of a poor person, which was supposed to be returned at night, not kept. Because what poor person, what's the one thing that they have? That's the outer garment, right? They use this to sleep in. They use this to stay warm. If they don't have this, you might have your underwear kind of thing on, like your loincloth, and that's it. Remember, this is going to happen at the end of time, too. Yeah? No, I, we're, we'll get to that in a little bit. I think it's going to take him out from us. So, well, we'll get to that shortly. So, they are taking these cloaks as a pledge. In other words, they're using them as collateral for money, for a debt, right? And they're not returning them at night. In Exodus 22, 26, and 27, if you ever take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, you are to return it to him before the sun sets, for that is his only covering. It is his cloak for his body. What else shall he sleep in? And it shall come about that when he cries out to me, I will hear him, for I am gracious." Even God has that. There are certain standards of living. There are certain things you need to live by, right? The do and not do. And so, and in verse 8, they drink the wine of those who have been fined. They literally are paying for the wine from the fines they impose on the poor. Because you think the rich are paying those fines? No. Bleeding them for every penny to support the luxury lifestyle style, the rich lead. And in verse 8 also, the house of their God. It could be the golden calves that they worship as their God or some other pagan deity. In any case, it is not God that they should, it is not the God that they should be worshiping. Right? It's definitely one other. So five things we can draw from the scripture um, on these verses so far. Number one is that the poor are oppressed for financial gain, no matter the amount. They will be oppressed for change in today's market, I'll put our environment. Number two, the poor cannot get justice because the courts are run by the oppressors, by the rich people. Even over sandals, they can't get justice. The sin, number three, the sin of immorality is running rampant. The woman is probably a reference to the cultic prostitution, having relations with the pagan temple prostitutes. And if you've ever seen this, you're on a ship. You, we'll use Ephesus as an example. You're on a ship. You come in. You've had a, like, a month or two at sea, and you want to blow off some steam. So what do you do? You go to the temple of Artemis, and you visit the temple prostitute. You maybe make a little offering to Artemis and stuff like that. You get some love from one of the ladies, and you can be on your way. You, your friends, and everyone can have the same woman if you so choose. And so, I don't, but bottom line, it was an incentive to bring people in to worship that pagan god. And it was not uncommon at all. When we were in Corinth, they actually talked about the temple of Aphrodite. You could always tell the worshipers that were mostly slaves because they had their heads shaved. They were bald, and they would give services for money because she is Aphrodite. She's a love goddess, and they would bring them back to the priest in the temple. Kind of sounds like a pimp and prostitution, but so that was the ancient world, though. And so they... I don't know if there's any temple like that right now here. No, not right now, but back then it was rampant. So... So we see that, right? That immorality that's just gone rampant. Number four, the sin of keeping the garments overnight. So you basically leave the poor literally with nothing. And you take anything he might have and, and 
I mean, I'm surprised they didn't try to take the loincloth. But um, and number five, the sin of enriching themselves on fines imposed on the innocent. We don't know how the fine, who was fined or who they were. But like I said, you know the rich weren't getting fined because the rich don't do that to themselves. So they're preying on the poor once again. They're drinking wine <clears throat> and buying that wine that they're drinking from money they basically extorted from people with false fines. Oh boy, that's something. And I love the summary that is in the Minor Prophets by, Boy by Boyce the book. It reads, he, that's Amos, describes the practice of sexual immorality in a temple dedicated to the God of Israel and comfort with objects extorted from the poor. Moreover, these sinners are so pleased with themselves that they even toast their success with wine dishonestly acquired through their corrupt legal system. This makes Amos sick and makes God so angry that his wrath will now come. And we can see how bad things got back then. And we can say, well, that was back then. But what do you think about today? Do things like this happen today? Is Amos preaching to us as well? Is there ever a case in America, perhaps where we live, that justice is perverted and the poor are oppressed? Yeah. Or even a case where the rich get off because they can afford better lawyers and impress the judges. So, oh, man, I can't help but think of OJ. Yeah. Or where the poor are condemned because they can't afford good lawyers or do not impress the judges or they just get railroaded because nobody will stand up to them. How many times have they been coerced into confessions for things that aren't even true? Has it ever happened that someone has come to church to praise God knowing that the week before they used a questionable but legal means to acquire money from someone? Huh? Maybe even cheating someone out of money they need to live? Or let's make it a little nicer, though. Has somebody ever taken advantage of a situation and profited at the expense of someone less fortunate? They call that an opportunity in business, right? Well, he's down on his luck. I can give him, like, pennies on the dollar for that. God likes fair deals. If you screw somebody so much like turning the screws so tight that they're not even making money on the deal. God frowns on that. You know that's in the Bible because he hates weights that are not right. It says it in the Old Testament. So it's kind of the same thing. Um, we're not quite as bad to the point of Israel, <clears throat> but the world we live in, is it that far away? In verses 9 through 11, God recalls all that he's done for Israel, the blessings they've received, the times when he saved them, and how God has devastated their enemies. Israel seems to be lacking that attitude of gratitude, huh? And <clears throat> we can actually go back and look at the, the verses here. Oh, there we go. In 9, it talks about how he destroyed the Amorite before them, um, how they're like tall cedars or strong oaks, and they destroyed his fruit above and his root below. What does it mean when you destroy the root below? Like when Satan's going to be burned up root and stem, right, at the second death. They're done. They are wiped out. God wiped them out. He brought them out of the land of Egypt. He had Nazarites, right? He brought in prophets and Nazarites. Remember, Nazarites took the Nazarene vow. So like um, Samson was a good example. He was not supposed to have anything from the grave, anything fermented. So what do they do? They give him wine to drink. They are literally mocking God. God, you give us this stuff? Yeah, I'm going to make your Nazarite drink liquor. I'll show you, Lord. Oh, by the way, thanks for saving me. I just, I, I don't get it. But so, so we see this in those verses, right? The blessings they've received. The Nazarites drinking the wine. The prophets, basically, you shall not prophesy. In other words, I could very well just see him say, shut up. Don't tell me what God says. I don't want to hear it. 
Remember, I forgot which king it was in Israel, but when Judah, Israel and Judah were going to go on a joint campaign, and the king in, Egypt, or in Israel basically said, he asked, the Judah king asked for a prophet, and he goes, well, there is one, but I don't like him because he never tells me anything good. Well, isn't it saying that about Elijah? I don't want to see him because he never tells me the good things. I can't remember. It might have been. I can't remember which one it was. But about Elijah. Yeah. So we see all of this, right? And in verse 13, God says, He is weighted down beneath you as a wagon is weighted down and filled with sheaves. Now, I don't have any idea what that means, but the SDA Bible commentary does. They behold, the prophet gives warning of the chastisement to come because of the sins of the people and shows the utter futility of relying upon their human resources. And that pressed, right? So it says, Behold, I am weighted down beneath you. Um, this, so pressed is according to some authorities means to totter. According to others, and it's a little apostrophe, UQ is the equivalent of sug, depress. The form of the verb suggests that the following translations, I cause you to totter or I will press um, the phrase under you may be rendered in your place. And that's from the King James margin in RSV. The translation, I cause you to totter, suggests that the interpretation that the Lord will cause Israel to totter under her burden of punishment like a wagon shaking under its heavy load and apparently ready to collapse. Israel has no idea what is coming for them. They have yet to realize that without God there may that without God there may be some temporary success, right? And they were very prosperous at that time. But in the long run, there is only destruction and death. And little did the Israelites know how short their time really was. <clears throat> so we talked about this earlier, but Amos preached to Israel, probably from Bethel or that area around anywhere from 767 B.C. to 753 B.C. The first Assyrian invasion to Israel happened in 732 B.C. Not that long. Even at the longest, that's 35 years from the first invasion. And that is when Samaria was conquered um, and, and the last of the Israelites were carried away to exile, never to return. So the first invasion at best was 35 years from this time when it was preached. 45 years, they're all gone. There's not an Israelite left of the 10 tribes up there. I wonder if Amos still alive today. If who? Amos. You know what? We don't know because it was not that long considering. But So do you think the Israelites would have thought Oh, and quite honestly, that 35 years, right? If we go from 753 to 732, that's only 21 years. So it could have been as short as 21 years before the invasion started, right? And 31 years before they're completely wiped out. So if you would have told the Israelites then, you got 30, 40 years and you're done, they would have laughed at you. We're doing great. Our borders are secured. You, what are you talking about, Amos? You must have got... Over over during Noah time, when Noah preached to them, you know, uh, rain's going to come. Are you crazy? There's no cloud or anything. 120 right. years. Yeah. Now, now it's happened to Amos. So we see that, right? But they would have never believed it. They were called to repent, but they chose a different path. So then the question is, what about you and I? Is God calling you to change anything in your life? In my life? Have we asked God to reveal any defects in our character that might not be right with God that I might not even know or be aware of? Right? We're not supposed to have spot or wrinkle, right? Do we even have time to dilly-dally around this? What if I don't wake up tomorrow? That's a possibility. Every day is borrowed from God, right? What would be the next thing I would hear? Good and faithful servant, enter the joy of your master. 
Or am I going to see Satan trying to rally the troops to attack the city of God? Kind of sobering, huh? It's all a choice. And we are powerless except for one thing. We have the ability to choose. God has given us freedom of choice. Freedom of choice led to the first sin. Freedom of choice leads to salvation in God. That is the only thing we have as the power to choose. And if we choose God and you come to the cross daily, you might stumble. I do every day, near as I know. But God still picks you up and will help you and will bring you along. And when you repent and you're forgiven, and truly repent, he wipes it out from the book of deeds. And it's like it never happened. I've said this before. I hope to have a whole bunch of blank pages up in heaven. Because I have a past. But anyway, so that is why I hope all of us choose wisely. And even when you come to the cross and die to self and ask for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, if God is in your head, if the Spirit is dwelling in you, do you think it's going to help you make better decisions? I know, I know personally the days you start off with God as opposed to the days you don't, it's a lot easier to fall into a bad place when you don't. So, on that note, are there any questions? These are just the first two chapters. Next week will be chapters 3 through 6. And it's going to be all about Israel. But I can't tell you what it is because I haven't done the lesson yet. <laughs> Who is doing it? I am. Again? Yes. That's my lovely wife on AV. So, on that note, let's, um, let's pray then. <clears throat> Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we see how you have judged the nations in Amos, Lord. We see that it's a cry to wake them up and to change their ways. And especially for those that have the oracles of truth that know your law, that know your word, and Judah and especially Israel. Your desire, Lord, is to bring each and every person home with you. Lord, for us to cast aside sin and the temptations of the devil and to put our faith and our trust in you and you alone. Lord, that each and every day you might increase in us and the desire for self to rule might decrease. Because, Lord, right now we have two kings, our self and you. Help us, Lord, teach us to abdicate the throne and to make you Lord of our lives and all things, not only for us here, for all those watching, that the Spirit may actively intervene in each and every one of our lives to draw us closer to you, to transform hearts and minds, and to, Lord, to truly have us fully devoted to you and you alone. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for never giving up on us, Lord, for being patient with us, and Lord, for truly guiding us in the narrow and difficult path that we might traverse this land and come to a better land, that heavenly Canaan. We thank you for all you do, for your promises are steadfast and true, and all that you will do, Lord, and praise your glorious name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Happy Sabbath. We'll see you all next week.